a marketable title. Um, marketable title is going to be paid for by the seller, like we talked about that, to pay for the owner's policy in the title to ensure that it can track transfer with no encumbrances at all. Uh, in the general warranty deed or deed acceptable to the title company, um, there's different forms of deeds typically we use general warranty deeds, but sometimes um, foreclosures have a different type of deed. It still suffices as a deed, but it won't be a general warranty deed. Okay. There is a deed that transfers. And upon that, it's going to make sure that everything is free of all liens and encumbrances except zoning conditions, restrictions, deed restrictions, reservations, right away, extensive record of any, which do not materially affect the value of prohibited pieces of property. Or, and this is going to be residential deeds. So they're going to ensure that the property is located at residential zoning, et cetera, but they're not going to, unless you ask for deed restrictions, covenants, and those kinds of things, they're not just arbitrarily going to print those. So if you're in an HOA of any type, always ask for those documents up front from the title company. You need the HOA agreement, you need to know what the covenants and restrictions are within that HOA, and you need to ensure that it's a condo or a townhouse that you have forward any of the condo regulations that are in place as well. Even if the listing agent does not have that documented, ask the title company. You don't want to get into a situation, especially in a condo or a homeowner's association, like Fox Cross, some places like that. You can have dogs, but they have to be less than so many inches in height, less than so many pounds. Uh, your buyers need to know that. You don't want somebody with a mastiff going in over there because they're not going to let that dog. <clears throat> animals are family members for a lot of people. They're not going to give up their dog in lieu of a apartment. So always make sure that you ask that. Additionally, the condo covenants and restrictions are going to tell you whether or not that condo can be rented over time, if it has to maintain owner occupancy at all times. Uh, and that is huge when it comes into play for the condo association specifically, like the DeVille, for example, over on that same 12th and that same 12th Terrace. Those over there, they're probably one of the oldest units in town, but they're also one of the most restrictive units in town. You can't do much of anything over there. Uh, you would think that as old as it is, some of those would be relaxed but they are very diligent and they have a very strong board. They will not allow any rentals in there unless you were grandfathered in from years ago and you owned it 25 years. There are things in place that will allow it that anybody buying now is not going to have that luxury. Okay. The covenant restriction will typically be more on if there's seven in the title to make that make sense. Right. It'll be as long if there are tight if there are restriction and covenants on file. With the register of deeds, which is where they need to be to be enforceable, then at that point in time, the title company has access to them. So, as a buyer's agent, you always want to ask for those. Ask from the listing agent first. If they don't have them, and a lot of them don't get them, they should. They should be part of a listing packet on any of thing on any property that is located in an HOA. You'd be amazed how many agents don't follow that last step. So if you're going into one, you need to get it. Prairie Trace is another one. Prairie Trace is a homeowners association. They pay $95 for the pool. People think their covenants and restrictions are just for the pool. No, they're for the whole neighborhood and what you can and cannot do. Lake Sherwood has covenants and restrictions on file, especially regarding the type of fencing that you can put up on your property. Uh, now, where you're going to run into trouble potentially sometimes is that 
once the covenants and restrictions have been broken by somebody, they can go back and try to clean them up. And a perfect example of something like that that's going on right now is the Indian Hills subdivision over off of 10 and Indian Hills. There's like, I don't know, probably 100 houses in there. Um, Red Oak subdivision like that? Well, no, it, it, it's further. Red Oak is like on 10th and Irish. Okay. We're talking further west. Gotcha. Indian Hills. Okay. Indian Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three, four, five hundred thousand dollar houses that are sitting on three, four, five acres. Mm -hmm. Well, there's building restrictions in there. One of those restrictions is you can't have an outdoor. Mm -hmm. Well, people have bought out there. They have three to five acres, they feel like they can do what they need to do on their own property. And if you drive through there, there's several outbuildings already there. In this past year, I can tell you that an owner has bought out, two owners have bought out there um, and has ruffled the feathers, if you will, of the residents in there. They don't have an active homeowners association at this point, but they are resurrecting their homeowners association to enforce the covenants and restrictions. Happens too, because there's already outbuildings out there. What started this was uh, a client bought a property out there and it started construction on a Morton building. And one of the neighbors raised his hand and said, You can't do that. And he said, What do you mean I can't do that? There's buildings all around. Well, yeah, but you can't do that because it's against the code of restrictions. <clears throat> Through further investigation, this particular gentleman was just the icing on the cake for the neighbors, basically. There's someone else that bought a house out there who owns a semi, and he uses that road to turn the semi around. And the neighbors are upset because they have to maintain that road. And now you've got an 80,000 pound semi driving up and down an asphalt road. So they're trying to nail him, but in the process of trying to nail this other guy, say, he can't do that, he can't do that either. And the homeowners went to Fern, and Fern said, oh yeah, we can resurrect those, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> My question is, what are you going to do with all the people that are already in there that are doing it? the old boy network oh no we like eric so we're not going to make him do anything but if jacob's come and ruffled feathers and we're going to tell him he can't i don't know what the legal stance on that is my thing is it's it, it's if you're already in a neighborhood and there's already outbuildings there most people use outbuildings to hide their stock okay. so riding mode if i have three acres exactly so, you know, my whole thing is you have somebody who buys a $500,000 house and wants to put up a $60,000, $80,000 building to hide what they have. Is that worse than just saying, okay, now you can't have a building. So now you have a fifth wheel travel trailer, a razor, and all this stuff because you can't tell me I can't have that right. because I own it, right? So I can either put it in a barn and keep it out of sight, or I can abide by that and just flat leave it out in the open for you to look at. Mr. Neighbor, at the end of the day, which do you want to look at? My stuff or a building that fits the decor of the neighborhood? Right. So I have a real hard time understanding why you would try to restrict something like that, but those are why the restriction and the covenants are in there. Those particular restrictions and covenants were written when Whitmer sold that property for that housing development. Things changed, you know, that was 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Things have changed in 30 to 40 years. What has happened is people have dropped off. There really is no active homeowners association. Who do you have to enforce the covenants and restrictions if you don't have a homeowners association? Well, there's really nobody. And you know, in that particular situation, I personally called Anna Ortega and I said, 
you've issued a building permit based on this. So where are we at? It's like, Chris, we don't look at covenants and restrictions. We just look to make sure whether a building will fit on the lot that they're trying to put it on. Okay. So if the county's not going to follow the codes and restrictions, homeowner doesn't know what the codes and restrictions are. There's a defunct HOA and the covenants and restrictions didn't get passed to the homeowner. Whose fault is it? Where does the fault lie? <clears throat> so what I've learned is you ask, are there covenants and restrictions in place? You can't always assume that the eight, that the HOA questions on the seller's disclosure are answered correctly. Because if that seller didn't know and was never provided that information, they're going to mark that there is no HOA. They're not paying for homeowners association dues. They're not. So in reality, there really is no HOA, but it can be resurrected. At what point do they go back and grandfather? I don't know. I don't know where we're at on this one. I know that he had started building in my philosophy was there's no HOA to finish building and then they're going to have to bring you in too as a grandfather, but I don't know. There's attorneys involved. They're fighting it out. I don't know what the end result is. I would say a little bit. And again, it's why? What is the point? The other thing that uh, the other thing that has come up in those kinds of issues is there's it's land at like 85th and Barryton Road. I've sold land out there, three acre lots. They have covenants and restrictions. I pulled the covenants and restrictions, right? You cannot have any type of prefab built home out there. Can't have a mobile home, can't have even a modular home because they're prefab in construction. Another agent simultaneously listed the lot next door to the one that I listed. We got an offer on ours, and it was through another agent. And I said, What is your buyer's intent? Well, we're going to put in a double lane. I said, We can't sell you this lot because these are restrictions that completely prohibit that. We went to the next lot over. The agent didn't have any of that disclosed and wrote an offer on that one. I called the other agent, the listing agent, and I said, hey, if you get this agent coming to write an offer for you, I have researched it and you cannot put a double wire modular or a mobile custom home on this lot. That listing agent said, well, my seller says that there's no restrictions and covenants. Okay. Your fight that I'm telling you that restrictions and covenants clearly state it can't happen. Well, yeah. that one wound up not closing either because I kind of blew the whistle. Because, you know, the people that bought the lot that I had for sale, for example, um, were building a $300,000 house. They didn't want to live next door to a mobile home. Again, it, it's a matter of choice. But if you go out there in that area and you start looking, the people who have put manufactured mobile homes or double wide in those particular, they don't have garages, they don't, everything's sitting outside. You know, there's no intent to maintain. Well, if I was going to build a three or four hundred thousand dollar house, I would hope that my neighbors would have the same wherewithal that I would to protect the value of my property, and it's just not the case. So even when you're a rule like that, if it is subdivided prior to you listing, chances are there's going to be restrictions on that property. The restrictions are actually put on the property by the original owner when they subdivide it. Okay. That's where the restrictions come from. So in, in your experience in the last couple of years where we have powers to put in offers and 
plus or minus the balance, find out if it's going to fit for a buyer, blah, 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 blah. How do you deal with not having the time to read through 30 plus pages of covenant before taking the time? Well, if you're writing on the weekend, you're not going to have access to it because that was not what they were coming on that thing. Right. What I would do if I were the one writing the offer, I would protect my buyer at all costs, and I would put subject to the review and approval of any future existing covenants on file with the making a provision for on the covenant. No, exactly. Right. And do you feel like that?
Wester is the, is the original subdivision on the hill at the 21st by the mall. The Brookfield Man at 29th or 21st and Wanamaker. But as you go up the hill west, the three roads on the top of the hill, Arbonian Place, uh, uh, there's like three of them in a row, and I can't even think of them. Land over lane, land over lane, um, Arbonia Place, and I can't remember, but you would know them once you're out there. They're typically bigger, sprawling ranches, have bigger lots, that kind of thing. That's the original Sudley's Westridge subdivision. Well, David and I have bought a nice, it was a ranch house at three quarters of an acre in Berkeley. And we had built a pad on the side of our garage to store our fifth wheels. Okay. We had a neighbor. Now, mind you, the guy across the street from us had a motorhome. Uh, the guy two doors down had a boat. I mean, there were people, people were storing stuff like that, right? So we put the pad and we brought our fifth wheel. Well, the guy that lived directly next door to us verbally assaulted us on many occasions. He didn't like our time, okay? It was all about being our time. And it was gonna come hell or high water. We were not gonna park our fifth wheel. It was a deterrent to his property. So long story short, he created such a drama that they tried to resurrect the HOA. And I was like, y'all are crazy. These houses were built in 1972. Don has a motor home in his backyard right across the street. We see it every day and all these people. Well, because we wanted to park our fifth wheel they were then going to go make everybody lose their stuff. And we finally said, screw it. We're done. We don't care. We have a place to store it. We don't need to put it here. And basically, they said we could bring it home on Thursday for loading it on the weekend, and we could leave it there till Monday when we got back. Okay, it was a win-win for us at the time. And we moved. We knew we weren't staying. Part of it was we knew we weren't staying there forever. Our goal was to move out to the land and stuff like that. It just expedited us moving. And now the guy that created all these should die. And now I drive down the street and I just crack up because there's stuff everywhere. Old cars that in driveways. There's a car two doors down from us that has literally been setting in the exact same spot in that driveway since we moved 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's still sitting in the driveway. That wasn't an issue. But us parking a brand new fifth wheel next to our home was an issue. Right. So okay. it depends on what people, who people want to pick on at that point in time. So whereas I know what this guy's doing over in Indian Hills, we felt that in Westridge, not to that magnitude. But if somebody doesn't like you because of the color of your car, they're going to do whatever they can to create issues. And that is exactly what Dean Brown wanted to do, was to create issues. He didn't like us because we were gay. And, you know, so be it. I don't want to live next door to him anymore than he wanted to live next door to me. And this man literally would sit in his driveway and get drunk and just be belligerent to David. He'd be out working in the yard or working in the driveway and would just, he was just a nasty individual. Yeah. And after the second time that I had called police, they were like, we're out of here. This, this is ridiculous. We don't need this kind of So long story short, there were covenants and restrictions that never came forward because it was an enacted homeowners association for 20 plus people. So okay. in that, I'm oh, sorry, I guess, go ahead. I would say, so in that box you would put for residential use, yes. if it's an investment property that uh, you're going to rent out, you put for investment use? Yes, because you need to make sure that your property, again, can be rented. Can be rented. 
So if it is an infant, if it is, it would be residential slash rental or residential slash investment. And if they're going to have a business inside of their home, like a hair care, nail salon, whatever, they have to they definitely need it. to check out that because a lot, like even where I live, we don't have covenants and we have covenants and restrictions sort of on the road across from me, but I got involved in this conversation deeply because they, we don't live in a subdivision. There's four people that own a whole section. So we're protected on my side of the road. Nobody can tell us what to do. We're not a part of anything. The houses that are across the road from me are in the Makino and subdivision. And they're all five to 10 acre lots. And they do have restrictions and covenants, but it's one of those situations they don't have an active HOA. And a lady built Caddy Corner from me. And at first I was really freaked out because in their covenants and restrictions, you can only have a maximum of one outbuilding and no pre-built structures and no shouses or farm utility homes. Okay, it's very specific. Well, a gal bought 12 acres and lo and behold, I came home one day and there was another house by Morton sign in the front yard. I'm like, oh, no, we ain't, we ain't dealing with the show. So I called in or take on that one too. And that's when I found out that they will issue permits that they are not the patroller of the covenants and restrictions. And so then I asked her, I said, well, what do I need to do? And she said, well, if there's no active HOA, I don't know what you're going to do. But the, she said, be aware, we have scaled her back immensely from what she originally submitted a permit to build. I'm like, okay. And she lived, her original plans were just one more building after another more building connected and an arena, an outdoor arena, indoor arena, living quarters, all this stuff. And that they scaled her back to an outdoor arena, a stable with quote unquote living quarters, 600 square feet. And the house turned out to be really nice. Okay. It's not a detriment to the neighborhood. But you don't know. You know, if they came in and put the white vinyl picket fence all around their horse field. I mean, it looks really nice. They spent a lot of money. But who's to say somebody did buy that lot and brought in a used mobile home, double wide, and put it on the foundation? I mean, you just don't know what's going to happen. So they have protection against that. Run uh, scenario by say people um, run into a neighborhood that has four year old inactive HOA. Everybody has outdoors because it's the old country, they have more outdoors. Is there any way that I can protect my client and find a, an original HOA member to get them to sign something and say it's okay to build an outdoor home? How does that work? That is about the only way you can do it. You kind of have to go back to the original signers of the restrictions and ask them to correct. A lot of times those people are no longer alive. But that I don't know. Because you can't, like Whitmer, for example, Peggy Whitmer's still alive. She still lives out there. So they did go to her. She was okay with changing it. They just got on the page and said, Well, we want to pick and choose. Well, you can't pick and choose. Can I ask you then to find some sort of legal process to obtain that your client can go and I'll go to whatever? Well, they're going to have to change it to get them to be collected and redeemed. Which we went through about the story. And that particular case, we had a. Well, that's where we're at right now. And one of the clients is that case. And that they bought the house in Puerto Rico. So it, it 
Seems pretty good here. Okay, all right. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I issue going on. It's a never happened before ever situation, but it's including myself and the other person. So you just just research those things. And if it's a standard neighborhood, less four, they're, you're not going to have them. They're not going to be, I guess there was at one point in time, but kind of made things up. You know, it just, you just have to be aware and ask the appropriate question. Because you don't want to have that buyer to go do something and then some mid construction is told, oh, you can't do that. Um, encumbrances created by the buyer. In other words, if somebody came in and did do this, built a building, and it wasn't part of an HOA, and the buyer got away with it, they're not going to insure the building if it was not originally accepted. Does that make sense? So that would be an encumbrance created by the buyer. Installments, if any, or special assessments, not yet due. Tenants' rights. You're going to put NA here unless there's this investment and then it's going to be like passive property because if for example you have you buy a residential investment property and there's a lease in place you have to honor that lease title company is not going to protect the tenant against that lease so this one tenant rights would be not applicable if it's a standard transaction if there are tenant rights, you're going to put tenant rights in place, something like that. There are rights to the tenant on this property. I just want to acknowledge that. Because when you sell a property that is currently under a lease, the lease rolls with the property, not the buyer. So he can't go in there and all of a sudden say, well, you're out, or come in automatically say, you know, it's great. I'm your new landlord. No, by the way, your rent's going up next month a hundred dollars. You can't change the terms of the lease until the lease is expired. When you buy a property that has a lease in place, you're buying the lease with the tenant. That will require you to send a copy of um lease agreement to show them the manager. No, but you I require that you have it because if you have a property that is currently leased, the rent roll, everything that is associated with that property, rent rolls, tenant applications, any complaints, any issues, all keys, all deposits, all of that that pertains to that property has to move forward to the new buyer. Deposits are very, very, very important. Prorated rent is very important because when that tenant moves, the new buyer is the one that's going to be reimbursing the deposit, not the old seller, because they're no longer a part of that property transaction. So any deposits that they accrued through that process have to move forward to the new buyer of that investment property. So uh, you'll always want to ask for current rent rolls, current tenant leases, and current documents in place for the protection of the board. And then any other exceptions is written on the written on the title. So typically it's residential, residential slash investment, NA or in place, and other exceptions is not known. And unless you specifically know it's in place. Um, liens, liens. 
seller shall pay out contractors, subcontractors, labels, suppliers for all work done and material furnished by to the property and prior to the close of the contract, which might be the basis of the mechanic's lien. Again, we've talked about this before. Companies, bigger companies, have people that go out there and scour the listings all the time to see if debts that are owed that haven't been collected on can be attached. So it's not uncommon. It's not real common, but it's not uncommon for a mechanic's lien to be placed on the property from the time you pull initial title to closing. So you need to make sure when you're listing a property as a buyer's agent, you're not going to know this, but as a listing agent, you need to say, are there any outstanding debts against this property that could come back in the form of a mechanic's claim? What are you talking about? Well, have you had any contracting work? Have you had any work that the bill is in dispute or hasn't been paid? And if they tell you no, then you move on down the road. Mechanics liens typically, like I said, get placed on properties where a bill didn't get paid. And now they know it's for sale. They're going to step in because they are guaranteeing they're going to get paid. Because the minute that judgment is placed on that property, they get paid out of title first. Um, escrow. Whatever company you decide to use as your title company is going to be our escrow company. We do not hold escrow money in this office. I don't want an escrow account. I don't want to be a part of it. I will give you this part because we talked about two, five, nine, ten, twelve, and fifteen. So we'll jump down to it. Um, property insurance and loss or interim maintenance. On interim maintenance, the seller shall maintain the property in improvement in its present condition and deliver possession in a like or better condition than present. Reasonable wear and tear is separate. So when it's talking about when it's in its present condition, the condition that the property was in when you first got it. So I always tell my sellers, make sure you don't move your lawnmower till the last time. You need to mow the yard before you turn over possession. Clean up the dog poop in the backyard, make the property presentable to that buyer. It's, it's critical for your reputation as well as the buyer's agent's reputation as a listing agent. It's just good business standards to make sure your sellers understand the property needs to pass in a decent condition. You can't force them to do it, but I can tell you there's a lot of buyer's agents that have spent a lot of money getting houses cleaned after closing because the sellers just left. Just kick. They've moved on. Well, you can't take it for it because, I mean, you could because it's based on the current condition. Typically, those people, it's not going to be a real clean house when you look at it anyway. Um, but you gotta always get why well, I didn't have time to clean because they got possession at closing. Well, no, you knew when it was closing for a month. So don't tell me you didn't know to clean the house. You so how many of you that aren't paying attention to the you keep in contact with the listing agent about like, hey, so this that or the other pay attention to it. Um, I can tell you there's agents that put it in section 19 that the house is to be professionally cleaned prior to possession, paid for at seller's expense. Uh, you're seeing more and more all personal property of the seller must be removed prior to close, especially if there's an outbuilding. If there is an outbuilding, you've got to put that in there because you'd be amazed. Well, I spent $3,500 two years ago cleaning out three outbuildings of a property that the seller picked what they wanted and left the trash. Old motor, old tires, old fencing, old whatever. It, it was anything you could imagine. Yeah. Hay, used hay. Um, it was horrible, absolutely horrible. Um, my buyer was 
went insane over it. And it wound up costing $3,500 to clean it. Now, I'm sorry, but when was it first mentioned? Have you read up the It was in section 19, but this particular seller, we couldn't have done. He, it, it was just a bad situation. But long story, I mean, he didn't move out of the house until the day of closing. He didn't pack anything. Everything went into a truck just by hand. Yeah. It was not a good situation. The buyer's moving truck was sitting in the road waiting to get access to the driveway. It was a bad situation. I had a divorce. The divorce was ugly. He was forced to sell the house. He had been living in the house. And truly, to the day of closing, he had nowhere to go. He never thought it was going to close. He just played along. And I was dealing with a Kansas City agent, and it was just not good. Yeah, I mean, I recently had a closing where we did the walkthrough the night before, and they weren't moving out till the next day. So they were still packing stuff, boxes, and everything else. But when we got possession of them, there was still a small apartment worth of stuff in the house. We're like, okay, well, luckily we're not moving in immediately. So you have a day to get all this stuff out of here. You're like, well, do you want this? Do you want that? It's like, no, take it all out. We're not paying to have an old washer removed. They're like making a bed and hooked up in here. Yeah. And it's amazing. It, sellers, when they get to that point of desperation, is when you get furniture left, weight benches left, old appliances left. It's like, well, they can, um, they, they'll use it. They can do something with it. Yeah, well, no, because, and I literally, this was when I was working at Remax, and it wasn't my client. Um, it was a client, it was back when I was on the team. So it's been many, many, many years ago. But a gentleman bought a house and the sellers thought, we're doing a nice thing. We're going to leave our washer and dryer. There's nothing wrong with them. It was a house over in the 1100 block of Medford. So I'll never forget. And it, so it was not an easy removal because a lot of those basements have rickety stairs, right? right. They didn't want to move it out. They just didn't. It was newer. It wasn't bad. They weren't in bad condition, and they were. This man, the buyer, threw an absolute fit, would not go to closing until he had proof the washer and dryer got removed from the house. Um, we were like, well, you can sell it. You can keep that one. My mom and dad bought me a washer and dryer as a housewarming gift. Those need to be gone before my parents ever see this house. And we literally wound up searching to get something and got the old boils at 29. And they came out and removed the washer and dryer for free and took it and sold it at their place. So, I mean, you run, what, when somebody thinks they're doing something nice, it's only nice if the buyer's in the it could be brand new, but if they don't want it, they don't want it. Well, that's, and it needs to be gone. And that's where the seller can say, you know, if would you like to have us leave the washer and dryer? Right. Yes or no. We'll have that if they do it after closing if you want, right. or after the contract is accepted. But if they say no, you gotta take it. Right. Unless yeah. it's on the seller disclosure, like you're saying. And you know, well, in that case, if if it's on the seller's disclosure that they're leaving it, but they put a notation that it's not working, no buyer needs to deal with that. Take it, leave it on. Thank you. Yep. Remove all personal property from residence prior to closing. Or they want to let the people on the block and have the seller take care of the driving to work and just write up uh, the senior charter from property prior to closing. That's just all I have. Uh, property insurance and loss. This 
it's an interesting one in the state of Kansas. Seller agrees to maintain in force until the closing of contract all property insurance now in effect on the improvement. In the event of loss or damage to the improvements prior to the closing of the contract, the insurance proceeds plus any deductible to be paid by seller shall at the option of the buyer be used to repair the damage or applied to reduce the purchase price. If proceeds are inadequate to restore the improvements to substantially their same condition as before loss or damage, or in the event of an uninsured loss, contract may be canceled at the option of either the buyer or the seller, seller or the buyer. Buyer will obtain the insurance binder by X date. We don't need to change the This is an interesting paragraph. Add a property under contract on High Street. Uh, it's an investment property. It's being sold to another investor. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a house exploding in the middle of the Cochin out of Walker High, and it created damage to the houses on both sides. I have the listing directly to the south of that property. When the house blew up, it took off the north side of the house that I have listed. Tenants were in the house at the time and were trapped under the bridge. Long story short, they didn't own the house. They were leaving anyway. They were moving. The city came in and condemned the property because of the north wall being removed. Couldn't get into the house to get the tenant's personal property. It was deemed unsafe. They had to move immediately. They still had a couple of weeks left. Long story short, now we have to talk to the other party because now we have a substantial loss. And it's going to take a lot of work to rebuild. It was rebuildable. So my client got a hold of the insurance company. Insurance just came out, said it's going to be X dollars uh, to fully rehab the house, et cetera, et cetera. So then we went to the buyer's agent and said, okay, here's what we have. Here's what do you want to do? Well, my buyer, being an investor cash buyer, wants to reduce the price of the house the cost of the deductible and the repair estimate from the property. We're like, okay, we're good with that. House was on screen and clear. So <clears throat> we reduced the price of the house by that amount. And my sellers just walked away from a house that had just basically got destroyed with still some money in their pocket because it wasn't a thing. Had that not been there, we would have had no work done. No, it's kind of extreme. Where you're going to run into this is spring and summer. That's typical. Hail storm. Wood. Always. If you have an ice storm, the branch is coming down. I always panic when I have a house listed in the spring and summer and they tell me there's a big storm coming in. Because the minute anybody in town sees a hailstone, all of a sudden we get a new road. And the houses that are under contract all of a sudden have a deluge of rippers. You got three rippers that say it needs to be replaced, and you got three rippers that say there's no damage. Well, you got to do whatever the buyer says to do at that point. Would you then have the buyer? I mean, in my case, I've had that happen a couple of times where I just had the buyer's insurance company just go out and go and just destroy them all. And that works as long as you have an insurance agent that's willing to do the paperwork to make that happen. But I will tell you, there's a lot of insurance companies don't want that responsibility. Right. And they will tell you, well, we don't go out and look at the houses until a couple of months after closing. That's a really, really bad practice because we've actually had roofs come 
back is uninsurable after closing. Right. And at that point in time, I'm sorry, but I go back to the you had the opportunity and you specified the cost. The contract gave you that right. Right. I can't help if your insurance company chose not to go check this out. The reality is you had every opportunity, you chose not to exercise that opportunity. Not really sure we can help you. Well, then you also have after they go out, if your insurance company says it's not insurable, well, the seller's going to have their insurance company come in and go out and say, well, it is insurable. And then you have to have an independent third party go out and you just kind of work off that independent third party. And then you're three weeks behind on the closing date because you have all these different parties and you go climb the roof. Yep. So never fun that it happens. I used to be that person. Huh? Yeah, you're who I'm pointing at. You used to do that. You work for Quillen or not? Yeah, Quillen. Was that everybody seems to know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I knew Quillen. Yeah. He used to be an agent. Yeah, he was here for a while. Right. So, do me a favor go down a little bit back to nine that flood part on the word. Buyer needs to be aware that federally designated high risk flood areas are subject to change. Buyers should consult, consult their insurance agent, city or county planning department for information to the planning service. Always, without fail, and I told you guys this before, I don't care where your house is, look at the flood zone map and speak up. There are flood zones in this town that you would never, ever in your wildest imagination think they're on. Yeah, I'm on the quilt creek. So literally, my house is three sides is surrounded by flood zone, but mine's not. Right. So he doesn't, but the complex does, and they have a master policy on the complex. So some people do, some people don't. The other ones are um, Shadowwood went together as an association paid the money for elevation certificates. Shadowwood does not require flood insurance the last nine years. They have changed, but they typically don't. That's off of Moffin is where that's right. Right, but yeah. you cross Arrowhead, same contractors, same style of property, same everything, and you get in Fox Cross townhomes, those all require flood. It's because the one association took the time, the money, and the effort to appeal it. The other one did not. So you have Birth Tree, which requires flood insurance, and then you have Shadowwood that does not. Right. And honestly, that was a that was a determining factor because my brother moved into Shadowwood instead of Birth Tree. Right. So yeah. typically, what's flood insurance? A uh, flood. Yeah. A lot. Um, it would not be uncommon for a Fox Cross to be anywhere between eight and twelve hundred dollars a year, uh, and that's just for content insurance because they only require a CO six policy. And uh, you get into an actual homeowner situation where uh, they have to pay flood insurance. A lot of times, the flood insurance will outweigh the desirability. The perfect example of that neighborhood is Shunda. All those houses in Shunda over off of 21st and Washburn. That used to be a primarily perfect spot to land as a first time home buyer and that kind of thing. Houses were always kept up. They were great three bed, one and a half bath. They're nice homes. They really aren't bad homes at all. Built in mid century modern, but it was healing. Then they changed the 100 year flood plan. All of those houses in there that all of a sudden were eighty, ninety thousand dollar houses at that time dropped to investment value. And a lot of the people that owned those houses started selling them investors right and left. Get out of the flood insurance. Some of those houses, the flood insurance was sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars a year. When you're paying $125 to $150 a month just in flood insurance 
on top of your mortgage and your other insurance, you were spending as much in payment as if you'd have bought in West Ford or Prairie Trace. So they lost all their value. That was horrible. 50 feet of one of them on the pool map to be on the production insurance provider. No, basically what I would do is say based on the Shawnee County flood map, your house is not included. You need to probably concur with the insurance department because they have to do a flood cert on every property anyway. They want to just require it. So, <clears throat> and typically you're going to be out of it. Now, it is a lender's discretion on flood insurance if the property is touched by the water but the structure is not. Technically, anytime there's flood water involved on the property, they have the option of requiring flood insurance. Right. They built specifically where they built on that property because it had the highest elevation and the house itself did not set in a flood zone. However, it was 18 acres and 15 of the acres were in AE. So if the property is all underwater, should it flood, the house will never get flooded based on the map. So that house didn't require flood insurance. Uh, Capital Federal was the lender and they looked truly at the structure. Some independent mortgage brokers, Fairway, those kinds of people that market, that sell their loans immediately, they may have somebody come in and pick it up and say, well, we're going to require flood insurance on this property. So you really need to know. So it's either truly yes or unknown because you don't know what's going to happen when the final determination rolls out. We can look at it and say, no, it's not in a flood zone. And a lender can say, well, the northeast corner of the property is in a flood zone. There is a chance that it could get to the property we're going to require. And then I had a situation in Rossville where, oh, Rossville, Florida. <laughs> yeah, where the house, the, the ground level of the house was in a high enough elevation, but the lower level was still under the water table. So they don't have flood. Almost all of Rossville has been built. Right. And it has had a dramatic effect on the value of those homes. Right. And the state. All right, Alec, any questions? Um, none so far. Um, can you scroll back up? I, I wasn't able to ask. When you said that there was the the tenant's rights. Um, is none, can you put none? Is that the same as saying NA? Yeah. Or it has to be NA? No, you can put none. Okay, all right. That's all I needed, thanks. I don't care what we put. If it's not applicable, just put none, not applicable, zero, whatever. Okay, sounds good. All right, you guys, next time we're gonna go over inspect.